Jules, thank you so much for being here. How long have we known each other, more or less? More or less? You're going to have to help me with this one. My memory is not great. Uh, let me start off you were... also thank you for having me here. I'm uh, glad to help and it's awesome uh, catching up with you again. Awesome. And especially in this setting, it'll be a lot of fun. Great. Um, we've known each other for... Since you were 14, maybe. Something like that. Yes. 14, 15, I would say. Yes. It's unbelievable to think that, you know, what is it? Two Grand Slams? One Masters, one with mixed doubles, couple of semis, unbelievable. Like he reminded me first, right, as a couple in doubles yes. in the world. Yes. Third, as an individual. Yes. Right. When I think of that, to me, it's a little crazy. Just to see you and know you since you're 14. <laughs> um, if you truly ask me, I never could imagine that <laughs> you were gonna be this big. When you think about it, what comes to your head? Um, I don't know. I, I, I very few times, I really do, I very few times sit down and look back at uh, some of the achievements. Um, and not that there are a lot at all, it's just that for me, I never would have thought uh, to win Wimbledon, for example. That's, uh, that was your first, right? That was my first uh, men's doubles Grand Slam. I remember. And uh, that was crazy. I mean, the whole experience was crazy. And I never would have, uh, I never would have dreamt that or thought that I would be there on center court playing this match and winning and the whole, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, so I don't sit back and reflect too much about it. I try to really live in the present and keep pushing forward because uh, at this age I'm not the youngest anymore and I only have a few years left. So I would like to, you know, just uh, keep the pedal to the metal and go as, as much and as focused as I can for now. But I'm very proud of all the accomplishments. Um, some of them uh, caught me by surprise, absolutely. Some of Those them, the as we'll, I'm sure, discuss, um, didn't go as planned as well, because uh, I'm achieving a lot of the success in my doubles career. I also played singles before that that didn't go um, as good as I wanted it to. So You got to 200, not that bad. I got to 200, I got to 200, <laughs> um, not bad. Uh, so, you know, so yeah, a lot of ups and downs, but extremely uh, proud and, and happy with the achievements. Well, we're happy you're sitting down and reflecting on them, so it's always nice, so you should do it. Um, getting into more or less of what we want to talk about, when you were a kid, right, growing up and being a tennis player, a lot of kids do this, a lot of kids want to get to where you are. <clears throat> what, did you ever think that you were going to be this big, or did you ever, I'm sure you dreamed about it, but did you know, or when did you know you were going to be big? So when I was little, I dreamt about being on the big stages. It was not so much the Grand Slams and everything that I thought about. It was more of um, Edward was an idol of mine and these kind of players. And I was watching them when I could on TV. I, I grew up on a small island in Curacao, so we didn't get a lot of these tennis matches. But the few that I could see, I, I was watching him play a lot and a few other players like that. I, I never... Um, I never had the dreams of winning Wimbledon, really. I just had, I wanted to have success and make it whatever that meant in, in singles, in tennis. So I wanted to make it. And for me, it was You more, just wanted to be a pro. I wanted to be a pro. So for me, it was more like I wanted to stay in the official uh, hotels in beautiful cities. I wanted the official tournament car to pick me up, which at the time was Mercedes-Benz. And you watch these programs on, on TV. And the, I wanted to live that kind of a lifestyle, you know, to go to the nicest city, stay in the best hotels, have the tournament cars pick me up and these kind of things. So I wanted to make it. And by that, I, I mean also, I guess, having the respect of my peers. That, that was the whole... Uh, that's make. a big, that's a big thing. Yes. Yeah. That's, and that was making it for me. So I didn't have specific goals. And mm. I think that uh, has to do with where I came from. So I didn't have those specific, uh, I want to be number one in the mm. world goals, but I wanted to make it. I knew I wanted to make it. And more importantly, I knew I found my passion uh, when growing up on an island, the good thing about it is we play a lot of different sports. Baseball is the number one sport. Did you play uh, baseball? I played baseball as well. I swam. I did taekwondo. I, I did every. I did everything. So, yeah. so now that I'm sorry to stop you, but now that you talk about that, when did you know this is it? I'm going to tennis. I had to make a decision uh, when I was 12 years old. 12? That's I, yes, that's uh, when I sat down with my family. It's funny to say, right? Because a 12 year old, I don't, my family sits down. You shouldn't sit down. Right? <laughs> and, um, and I'm trying to make a decision, but my family, um, they're really making the decision for me. But I knew that I wanted to play tennis um, because it's quite funny. When the baseball team would win, when the soccer team would win, um, in any of these other sports that I competed in, 
the team won and, and everybody shared the glory kind of. But as a young kid, when I won in tennis, I won and I had all the glory to myself. So it was more of a, the feeling of me winning alone uh, on the court or in my competition. I had uh, greater satisfaction when that happened. And as a kid, it was very like I wanted to win and I was mm -hmm. one. And um, funny enough how life works, I end up playing doubles, which is something that you share with someone else mm -hmm. you know, and, and you go through. <laughs> I need a partner to be able to do my job. Um, but uh, that's kind of how I picked tennis. So at 12 years old, it was a sport. Uh, I always had a racket in my hand. I always knocked the ball around the house. And uh, even though I was told not to. How many lamps did you, a did lot, you break? A lot, a lot yes. of lamps with a lot of repercussions. <laughs> I'm um, guilty for that too. And, uh, but. So, and my parents could see that in me. And of course, when I was 12, I don't know how we all came to the agreement of that's what I wanted to do. But when you sat with them in that moment, because it's funny when you talk about that moment, I remember my moment when I had to say, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do. I do remember my dad put me in and he's like, you have to tell me if you really want to do this. I never understood what he meant, but I was 11 or 12 and he said, do you want to sacrifice basically your entire more or less your entire youth and you're going to be different than anyone else. So when you sat with them though, how important for, I guess, parents now and coaches and families that sit with these kids, how important is it for the parents to listen to the 12 year old, you think, even though you're 12 and you don't, yes. you know, I think it's a combination of things. I think the things, I think, uh, so you have to listen to the kid because <clears throat> I don't, um, my parents could see that I love tennis. I don't like tennis. I love tennis. It, Obsessive. It, it stood out more yeah. than the other sports, you know? So mm -hmm. I liked swimming. I liked baseball. I liked soccer. I liked these things, but I love tennis. And mm -hmm. I think they were ob observant parents. They were very much uh, into my youth and very, very much around me. Involved. Good eye, very much involved. And they, uh, they could see that it was a, I mean, it was a parent that I love tennis much more than the other sports. And with that being said, um, it's also important, yes, the kid has a say at that age, at that, uh, sorry, at that time, but it's a young age. So many times the kids don't really know what they want. I knew I wanted to play tennis, but what does becoming a professional, leaving your house, uh, doing these things, I don't know that as a kid and in a way neither did my parents. So you kind of try to make the best decision and you have to go off boat. So you can't just listen to the 12 year old. As a 12 year old, if you're good already, at least in this stage, day and age, Kids have a coach, they have a coach, right? They have a coach, they have a parent, and they have the kid. <clears throat> coaches want to make decisions for their players as tennis coaches. Parents want to make decisions as, as parents, and kids are kids, but they are the tennis players. So when you make these type of decisions, how would you advise parents or coaches, right? Because there's a combination that needs to happen. You just talked about it. Um, we need, I believe, you know, this is weird to say, but we need parents that get it more. Um, I think coaches and parents need to be a little bit more in sync. Um, but in terms of the player, how would you help the player listen to the coaches and parents? Like, because the kids are emotionally not that intelligent and not that mature and sometimes they get upset at certain things so i think this uh, to answer your question very directly i think this has to do a lot with parenting actually <laughs> regardless of because if you want to give the coach a chance and listen to the coach um it's how you were raised or how you were brought up that's yeah. going to allow you to really listen to your coach or brush aside whatever correct telling you. i agree so 100%. i think parenting is the first step in this whole mm. thing um the part where I left out in the decision making, so it was myself and my family, there was my first coach by the name of Robert Gomez. He's still here. He's actually at the Biltmore. You might know. Oh, no, I do. I never knew you. Yes. Okay. Robert was my first coach. Where? And uh, he's now at the Biltmore. No, no. Where did you play with him? I didn't. So when I was eight, so playing in the eight and unders, 10 and unders, 12 and unders, my family would make these, uh, these trips to, to Miami mm. and I would play in the YMCA's and in these small tournaments. Wow. And in one of these tournaments, Robert saw me play and thought I was good, which I was not at 12. I promise you that. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> I was not very good, and but he met my father, and he liked him for a very also, mm. and they bonded right away. So my father then eventually said, "Well, if my son wants to go play tennis, I'll put it together and send him with Robert, who's a disciplinarian that he trusts." So you would say Robert recognized how yes. your dad 
brought you up yes. and was like, this is going to be good. Recognized, but also my father had the direct correspondence with him as far as when I would come to the tournaments, they would have their conversations without me knowing. I only found this one after. When I had this conversation with my, with my parents, it was quite easy because I said, okay, well, you want to leave Curacao and go live in, in the United States uh, and do your schooling and all the stuff that comes with it. Um, we're going to send you then to stay with this guy that we trust and we know that he's going to really look after you in the terms of... And this was at what age? This was at 12 years old. This, this is when you decided, this is it, I want to do tennis, I'm moving to Miami, yes, right? That's when I stopped everything and left everything behind. And to your points earlier about um, sacrificing everything, you still don't know that as a kid because we don't have a tennis culture in Curacao. Um, Rafael Nadal, when he was 14 years old already, he's practicing with Carlos Moya. So Carlos can explain to him a little bit of what it's like and what, he, what he's going to go through and the sacrifices and the ups and downs. But I had no idea. Right, the things he heard when he was 12 or 14, you never heard until... Never. Right. So still, I made, this, I made this decision, but I still didn't know about the, sacrifice that were com the sacrifices that were coming up or um, yeah, all, all the stuff that you're going to go through and the ups and downs and how hard it really would be or it really is to make it. So, um, but it was a decision at the time. When you make a big decision like that as a family um, for the tennis player that you think he's going to be whatever he's going to be or she, um, you need to be sure as a parent that you'll know, for example, you, you went to Miami, you left home, that's it, you're not living at home. Like, for example, where did you go? Like, I lived in a house on 87th and, and Galloway. <laughs> um, get emotional already. Okay, and before you keep going, I, I'll give you some time. But um, as a parent, you need to know what your kid's going to go through. And you need to be very good. You need to know when you call, right? When they're calling you, you need to know what to say. Yeah. You cannot start pressuring. You cannot start saying all this crazy things that a kid has no even idea what you're talking about because the sacrifice from the parents is so big. Yes. Right? Um, yeah, the sacrifice, I, I, don't, I, I said this, uh, of course, off camera when we started, but I very rarely talk about it and I would love to discuss it because I need also the family and the kids to understand what they're getting into. Right. Um, but the sacrifice is big and uh, I tell people, like, for all the achievements and stuff that I have now, um, it's not gonna buy me back the time that I lost uh, with my family. You know what I mean? Like so. So. Yeah. What do you do? That? We <laughs> we uh, all did, it's but it's I okay. Discussed, so I, it's, yeah. a, it's a part of me that I hide, and I. We're gonna um, keep hiding, and we all get it. It's not. It's just we. I don't. I never talk about it, but. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult part, and like I tell everybody, like my successes and stuff, I'm happy that I've had it because there are other people that sacrifice equally or more and don't get any um, rewards for it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna stop you for a second there because, and I'm, and I think even if we're in this interview, I don't really care. I'll, tissues, I'll help you. <clears throat> you have tissues? No, no, I'm good. Oh. Um, no, uh, so sorry. What you just said there about, you know, there's people that make sacrifices and tennis players that don't get what you are getting now. Um, which again, it comes from everything that you've done. Okay. So. Me, for example, and I'm going to talk about me because I've done it. Mm -hmm. I did it all just like you. I left home, my parents, everything. I didn't get to where I thought I could get. But I have a lot right now. Not in terms of Grand Slams, not in terms of whatever. I got to 400 in the world. But I did play college. I did do something that's very big. And I believe that all kids and all parents doing tennis need to understand this like yes you need to make sacrifice and yes it will be for something will it be for a grand slam i don't know will it be for a atp masters to be one in the world i don't know but it is going to be for your kid to be the best version of themselves yes. later on. And I believe it is so important for even parents and coaches to hear that from somebody like you, because your sacrifice translates into an actual Grand Slam. Yes. But there's so many other ways that sacrifice can, you know, and what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I think that's a very good point. Um, and the beautiful part about tennis is, this is the beautiful part about our sport that the Okay, I left my home, and like you said, nothing was a guarantee, but 
you're bound to gain knowledge uh, from your experiences and okay well if you went to play tennis you're going to be practicing practicing it every day you're going to be competing at a, at a decent level the discipline. 400, that's a very high level yeah um, and you learn the game you meet a lot of people playing the sport and that leads to many things and opens many doors and correct um, a great path or a great also choice that tennis gives us everybody from youngsters that's what i want the young kids to know is that we have the opportunity, especially in the U.S., to go to the to a university and play tennis, you know, and have a scholarship, whether it's full or partial, which helps families out a lot. And now you can continue on living your dream of playing um, professional tennis. It's a, it's a stepping stone while getting your studies, which for a family, that's all you really want, because after that, I feel like your kid's in very good hands. and. The, the opportunities in, in her or his, you know, in his hands to, to do whatever they want to make, uh, make whatever they want to make. Yeah, so we know right now that we're in the topic of college. You went three years to UCLA, go Bruins. Can you take us Bruins. to, um, through a little bit of, you know, because I graduated from UM, I did my entire career, I had an unbelievable time. Um, I was struggling between saying, should I go pro again or not? I decided not to. but. There's so many kids that have, well, kids and families that have trouble right now um, to choose between what do I do? Do I go to college? Do I go pro? Right? There is, people separate the routes and I believe, I believe, right? It should be one route together. Um, I want to know what you think. I mean, I know you left early um, and I'm sure this was a decision that you made on your own or? Yes, it's a decision I made on my own. Um, you were old enough already. You I got it. You got time. it. Right, this was my decision. This is now. your decision. But uh, yeah, I went to UCLA, like you said, I had a great time. The second, uh, this decision for me was actually the toughest decision for me, not the one that I was 12. The one that I was 12, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Right. So it was up to my parents, along with my coach, to really listen to what I was saying, seeing if that's uh, really valid or not. The tougher decision came, um, the, they came kind of within three years apart, was when I was 18, uh, now that I've been playing for the last six years and developing and getting better, right, from 12 that I was here, and now I'm 18 and I need to make a decision on, hey, am I going to go to college, but my level's improved and I have a very good uh, ITF junior ranking, am I going to play professionally, um, like most of my friends did at the time, they went and played professionally. I made good improvements from 12 to 18 and I don't know the improvements that I would have made, let's say I started playing professionally at 21, so I did three years of university from mm -hmm. 18 to 21. I don't know the improvements I would have made from 18 to 21 if I would have been on tour, but what I can say is that um, Maybe I wasn't, uh, let's say, mature enough to handle most of the stuff if I would have continued on to play professionally. So in my, sorry, in my case, the college route really helped me personally. Were you ready financially to make the step at 18? This was another thing. Financially, we weren't really ready to make the step. I have another older brother that wanted to go to school as well. And my father or my family, my parents had to fund him as well. My brother also, like you said, was going to school and, and we had to fund him as well, so the decision wasn't all based on mine. For example, after two years of being in UCLA, I was felt like mentally and physically and tennis-wise, I'm ready to go play professionally, but my brother just went from a pre-medical school, now he's doing his medical school, it's quite a bit of money, mm -hmm. and I stayed in school so that you know, we can... You will balance out the family. We can balance yeah. out the family. And this decision, like that decision was quite easy still because it was a I could see what was going on and I... I you were still safe at UCLA yes, too. Yes, I was still safe at yeah. a safety net, right? If I decide to stay, I'm quite comfortable. I, I know what, I'm, what I have here and how I can further on improve my tennis if I chose to stay. But I was ready to leave. Um, at the end, I stayed another year, so I did three years and left after my third year. Um, and that was the second toughest decision now mm. at that point because the first one was, will I play professional or not? We chose to go to college route. Um, which I absolutely loved and enjoyed. Um, and then the second one was, well, when, you know, am I going to finish my college career? Am I going to go play professionally? And that was another decision that I made. And because previously I had made a few decisions to stay in college, I think it was just that time that I felt the itch of like, hey, I want to play professionally. Right. I'm still young now. I want to do mm -hmm. it now. But off camera, we were talking there a little bit and I was telling you, well, 
I mean, if I look back at it now, I could have just done my fourth year and be done with school. <laughs> you know, like that wouldn't have, I don't think that changes my career path anymore right, at that right. stage. I think it's very individual. Whether it was ready for you, it might not be ready for the other person. And I think a lot of people need to just start understanding this. It's not about imitating. It's not about copying what the right path is, right? Yes. It's, it's about knowing what works for you. And I think that's what you did and it worked well. Yes. When, you, when you went, you had everything set, you had your coach or how did you? Not really, I kind of... Uh... <laughs> I was bringing it at the time. I had a strong uh, will and desire to play, that for sure. And I, that's how you play. I that's how you play. Myself, you know, like yeah. whole, I had an edge, definitely. Yes. I was going to go out and try my best, and I, I really. Um, and you were supported by your family. You were supported by supported just. By my family, uh, 100%, uh, always. Another. Uh, I have to go back in this, but another decision for me. From 12 till about 18, even we can really say to 21, academics was very important uh, mm. to my family. So, yeah, I hear I, your dad, he's a dentist. Yeah, my father's a dentist. Your mom's a teacher. My mom's a teacher. That's you know, big. My brother's uh, doing well, like this, he studied. You yeah. know, and um, it was big. Like my father always said, look, you're going to go and, and live with Robert and, you know, live in a different country. The minute you get bad grades, you're back to Curacao. So, that's, that's great. Yeah, that, which is great. That was now great. Looking back on it, I really liked it because it kept me studying. I wasn't the best student. I'm not the smartest. I, I studied because I wanted to play tennis. I wanted my opportunity to play tennis. And if that meant that I had to pass my grades, which was, that was my only ultimatum my parents ever uh, put on me. The rest of it was up to me, what I do with myself and how serious I take it or not. They wanted me to try my best. The grades were, that was a deal breaker. And I knew that. So uh, it's funny, when I got to university, I, I spoke to my coach the first day and I told him, coach, I'm not going to... Who was your coach? Same guy? Billy Martin. Yeah. Ooh. I told Billy, I was like, Billy, I'm going to get like, a, <laughs> like probably like a C average in school here. It's going to be borderline. I'm going to have some meetings with you. that. I but I'm talk. good, Billy. I'm good. A little bit more than I'm, I'm going to be ineligible, but I'll make my grades and I'll pass. And this is a serious conversation that I had. I wanted him to know that I was so serious about my tennis and that I will be dedicating the minute that I'm outside of class and I'm eligible and I pass my classes. <laughs> Uh, that I would be playing tennis, you know, and that's kind of how my schooling went. Uh, this is just how you were. This is how, this I is was. how you were. This is how, how I was. <laughs> okay. And uh, in, this, in this case, I promise you. We can this. talk about that off camera. Uh, 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 the best example, I promise you, because many, I had many other friends that played professionally afterwards right. that were very good in school, very good on the tennis court. This is just how I was. Mm -hmm. um, I loved tennis. I still, uh, I still felt the need there to, to go to school and, and my parents, we, we were not sure that I was going to make it, you know, like my parents had no idea, I had no idea, um, so there were still some doubts and insecurity there and that also led into my decision, although probably I never let that out uh, or, or tell my, I never told my parents that right. or my friends that because I would never right. show that. But yeah, we were not still, we were not so sure. And so to have a safety net or a backup plan, we went the college route to make it somewhat safer. Now that we're talking about this, but let's go back a little bit to when you were mentioning parenting and how that's a big one. And then you think that's one of the main issues here, how you're parented. Um, your parents always put a lot of pressure on the, on the grades, yes. right? For that, maybe you chose, and it was an easier decision to go to UCLA. Right, for that, when you were at UCLA, you kept your grades, you did good. But keeping that in mind, when kids go to college now, NCAA and everybody, when you're in college, they keep the standards up. If you don't have a certain GPA, you drop out, you can't keep competing, which is what we like. Yes. But looking back at kids, you think as now, kids are going to online school a little bit more right? They're not really going to school. They're not really enjoying their peers. You growing up, did you, you went to a regular, regular school in, or how did it? I actually went to a public well, school here in, in, uh, in Miami. I went to wait, Miami. I think I know it. I think I remember this. You went to, did you go with my brother or no? No, no, no. no, no. Okay. Well, my brother came here when he was 13. I thought you guys, but yeah, it's a rough school. I went to Miami Killing. Yeah. I went to Killing. Oh, you went to Killing? Yes. Okay. And that's, uh, that was my school. That was my school. Yeah. I had uh, how? my Kuipers there was uh, how I ended up there. <laughs> um, through playing some, some tournaments, I met uh, the high school tennis coach, Mike Kuipers. 
and he was my safety net there at that school. Like he made sure that hey, we're gonna keep Jules. In I hand. remember. We're gonna yes. make sure that Jules gets his grades. We're gonna, you know, and uh, which is huge because then when you actually want to go to college, there are standards. Absolutely. And parents need and to I remember this. Uh, I don't want to talk bad about. It. I love my. I love my Killian High. I love the fact that I, I went there. It roughed uh, you Cougar, out. Cougar for life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we. Um, it's. Uh, it's. It was a tough school. It, it was toughed school. you out. It was tough. And I was not hanging all the time with the right crowd sometimes in school and I thought, you know, it was cool and these Who things. kept you in track, Mike? Mike kept me in check definitely through my high school. Mm. Had very good contact with my parents again to make mm. sure I make my grades and to, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that helped me. And the other thing, to be quite honest, already in high school that kept me in line is my tennis. Because I was so passionate about my tennis that I probably wasn't going to risk it for anything else. Right. Not the coolest kids in school, not to make the wrong decision, not to... So at Was it point, hard for you to combine this though? Social, tennis, academics? Yes, I was always, uh, I would say, the socially, I don't want to say awkward kid. I don't think I was ever socially awkward, but I was always the outsider. I don't think you're awkward. No, I think you've done good for I was, yourself. I was always the outsider. <laughs> um, in terms of, I've never been to a prom, like, okay, you only have one prom to go to, but mm -hmm. I've never been to like any high school activity or, or the, the, anything that we had. I really liked the path that I took because it formed me as, let's say, a man, but it formed me as a player and everything. So I wouldn't change it. And the sacrifices that my family had were real. Like those are... Like, those are real things. Like those real. Are real things. Like, wait, so, so I don't easily say, oh, I wish I would have changed this to, you know, so... I respect and you can't really say that after they've made such a sacrifice. No, no. So yes. I don't even. Do, that's why I always get emotional talking about them. But I don't so much go back and question or doubt anything. I just. You keep going. Okay, good. That's great, and that's how we're gonna do it right now. Yeah. We'll keep going. I want to hear from you because you see the sport a different way than all these people growing. Yes. I see the sport. I see a lot of sides to it. I see a side of coaching, playing, developing. But it's like this is what I want to achieve for an angle like you, like you guys, the pro players, to say this is what really matters. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, what really matters is, like you were talking about now, developing, I have certain routines, right? The, the routines really matter, to mm -hmm. do them right every day. When I go and I practice, when I go and I, and I get ready for a practice, I do the same boring routine every day. Literally the same. Literally the same. Yes. And it's the routines that, it's my injury prevention, it's my warming up, it's part of just getting ready for practice. And then you practice and then on the court and then afterwards again. In none of this, so in my daily routine, none of this will my phone be be anywhere near. It's not part of the so routine. So if I'm warming up, my phone's on to in, into my bag already. Mm. I cannot stand when we're practicing. This is I have so many pet peeves because I am an old school, let's say, school yes. and stuff. And yes. I grew up from an old school father and my old school first coach. If I'm practicing and another player or my partner, which granted he never does, he's very good at it, and now is you know on the phone, that absolutely destroys me because again, I see that that person is not really engaged. It takes you off focus You're of what engaged. really what matters. What really matters right now, it's not that important to you. So what it tells me is that it's not really that important to you. Right. What's more important is to know, you know what's going on, the latest things, and the, but that's not really important. So if you can't put it off for two, three hours while you do your job, and then you go for lunch and you finish eating and you want to check your phone, that's fine. And granted, it's not going to be like that, okay, now I finished lunch, now my phone, now my... Right. But while you're doing your job, it shouldn't be a part of it. If I'm talking to kids, right, if I go and I have a little conference and, I, and they ask me to do, be a guest speaker and I'm talking to kids, I would rather the kids leave the phone in a big bucket in the beginning <laughs> because I'm going to be speaking and then everybody's going to be on the phone. So some of the kids there are not really... Again, engaged. mindful and listening to you. Because you're at the phone and doing something yeah. else. But now I will take it a step further because my whole thing, the reason I'm sitting here today, honestly, doing so, it's because of my parents. Other, because it's a lot of it is parenting. Mm. I see kids where the parents are talking to them and they're on the phone. Like, we would, like I, that doesn't even cross my mind. If, I were, if my father were to speak to us, you stop what you're doing in a second. You know what I mean? Like you're paying attention to what he's saying. You're not, no. <laughs> If there's no eye contact, you're in some trouble. So mm -hmm. I think uh, it's just very, it's difficult. It, it does start with parenting. If you're at the table, if I have my family and my wife and my two kids and we're eating and the kids are on the phone, that's unacceptable. But I think mm -hmm. nowadays we tolerate so much of these things and mm -hmm. we're in a car, right? I'm driving and my kids are in the back seat. Well, the kids would be on the phone. Mm -hmm. So it's just like we give them so much access to these things. And mm -hmm. 
I think that's where that's part of where it goes wrong because the kids feel like, hey, if I don't have any resistance in my own household, if my parents never tell me to, when somebody speaks to me, to look them in the eye and listen, like my first coach one time knocked me upside my head when a school teacher was talking to me and I was looking down because I was a bit timid and shy. Uh, you know, to look at that person in the eye. But we don't have that nowadays anymore. So we're kind of getting off track because we, we know each other for a long time and this is like a passionate topic of mine. Getting a little bit now forward, there is, um, and we're in the topic a little bit already, but there's misconceptions about what it is to actually be a pro. Like, what do you think people completely just get confused and they think this is what you guys do? I think, well, uh, I don't know if this is gonna answer your question. What I find with my normal friends, I don't think they understand what it takes to be a pro. Like they think that I just play tennis and I'm a professional tennis player and that's it. But not really knowing all of the stuff you really have to take into consideration from my diet, uh, the times I go to bed, you have a curfew, you have your own curfew uh, every night. Um, try to stick as, 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 as much as you can to your routines. Um, for me, it boils down even to some fun activities that I grew up doing that I can't. We talked about when I was right, younger. I love right. playing sports, right. but I can't play basketball. I can't play soccer. I can't play, because these are all risks to my, to my profession, to my job. Mm -hmm. Because if tomorrow I twist my ankle, well, that's gonna cost me. Or if I hurt my wrist or, so I don't go skiing and I don't skate. I've never I skied before. Do you know what I mean? So, so yeah. these are the things that, um, they're, they're real and, and proper, again, uh, I wouldn't say sacrifices, but lifestyle changes that you have to do. Um, and it's a 24 seven thing. It is a, it's a 24 seven thing. As Robert, my first coach used to tell me, like rest is part of your training. Like don't ever think that you're resting and you're, you know, rest is part of the training. So when you're resting, take proper rest and make sure you do the right things because the next day you'll have to be back at it and do the same thing again. And, 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 and this part of the project is interesting because so many times we grow up and coaches tell us what to do, right? Do you think that you, growing up, did you have something in your head? Or again, I think it's probably going to be parenting. You're going to answer parenting. But did you have anything that was different from any other of your peers? Like, did you listen to your coaches a different way? Did you... Because we all get the same advice. We all train together. I, 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 like, why, why it, did you... Why? It gets cliche and boring after a while because when I was younger, what they had told me, what my parents would tell me, it mattered. And they will test you on if you listened or not. You're not getting away with... Uh, with, I just told oh, you. No, no, yeah. yeah, I, I yeah, got yeah, it, yeah. I got it. And then, you know, like uh, five minutes later, they'll test you or, or see if you really got it. So um, I think it has a lot to do with that. The other part is that it was quite easy for me because... Um, I found my passion really early, so I knew that that's one advice that I always have for kids. Like, if you feel like you love something, that you love something, then you go for that thing. It could be, and I'm not saying that in a, in a derogatory way to anything. It could be cleaning up the ocean, it could be an artist, it could be music, it could be whatever your passion is. If you feel that you found it or you're really serious about that, because that's the other thing besides your parents when you're away from them that'll keep you in line. That'll keep you in line. That'll keep you away from being on the streets. That'll keep you away from hanging with the wrong crowd, you know? So really like finding that passion. So the other thing is my tennis that I just, I love my tennis so much growing up. Like, and I wanted to make it. So I was willing, I, I had the opposite problems of what most kids had. I listen too well to too many coaches. This person would tell me, hey, hit your forehand this way. And then the then other another one says, no, yeah. no, you gotta do this. Then another one, so that takes time because I was so, I mean, literally like a sponge, but absorbing everything that these coaches were telling me because I wanted to improve. My only thing is that I wanted to get better. It, it, it's very easy when you talk about it like that. I loved it, I was passionate, I did it because I wanted it. Through the years, and I think we all know this, did your effort wavered did it get hard and you're like oh my god I don't know if I can do this did pressures get to you being away from your family because it's very easy to listen to your coach and to do what they're saying when you love it and yes. when you're okay I was really uh, it was a matter of like ignorance bliss in my in my, uh, in my <laughs> like I didn't realize I didn't realize how small my chances were to even make it you know I was out there on the day-to-day -day listening to my coach doing it just doing it just doing it and as i was getting older some of my friends stopped some of my friends started dating some of my friends other interests other 
and I just kept doing it. I had one difficult uh, decision to make where it was either stop playing tennis or start my doubles career, which I find very interesting because up until that point, I, and even during that point making the decision, I kept working out because I, I knew that I was probably going to give it another go. But I was going to say I wasn't going to believe you that you didn't have a moment. I never, it's, uh, and, that, and that's, I don't know if I credit myself, it's, can you credit yourself for that? Is it pairing? I don't know what it is, but I never wavered, just the goal was clear and I wanted to make it. I wanted to, whatever the making it was, in that sense it was not clear. I just wanted to make that lifestyle. I wanted to be in the best cities playing and be in the hotels and being in these tennis programs and these things. And so I kept doing it. I never once doubted myself. I was not the most talented at all. If you would watch me hit a ball, you would know that. I was never, I, I take that back actually. When I say I wasn't more talented, there's two forms of talent, which I think kids should understand as well. Talent comes in the this form. Is, this is big. This is, comes yeah. in the form of uh, Roger Federer. That's super talented, right? If you watch him play, that's how you would ideally like- It's easy, somebody. everything's it's easy. easy. That's yeah. how you would like somebody to play tennis <laughs> or teach somebody tennis. And then there's a talent of, I'm gonna mention, let's say a David Ferrer, who was one of my favorite players to watch. That's the talent of waking up every day and doing your routines every day. Mm -hmm. That's the talent of outworking somebody every day. So mm -hmm. there's two types of talents to that and not everybody will have the Federer talent, for sure not. Mm -hmm. And not everybody will have the David talent. The more talented players, usually they, they, they lack in the day-to-day -day discipline. That's boring to them because mm -hmm. they're talented. But, and on the other hand, the players that don't have talent, that know they need to work day-to-day, you know, and that's the talent that I had. I was not very good at tennis. Mm -hmm. I just worked my way to, let's say. You figured it out. But through, let's say, hard work in this in this case, I definitely, I never relied on, ah, well, I'm gonna skip today because my talent's gonna get me through this, uh, you know. I, I didn't have, I. You didn't have the luxury. I didn't you have didn't. one day for that. So yeah. I, I would like kids to understand that that's a talent, like to be able to outperform or outwork your opponent. They don't day think day. they don't think that's cool. They don't that, think that's that. That might not be cool, but that's a lot of uh, that's how a lot of people make it as well. So it's not cool, but they need to understand that is being a professional tennis player. Yes, it's part of it. Yes, but it's a lesson. We're talking tennis now, and yes. I don't want to sound like the great philosopher here, but it's a it's a lesson in life because. You might not be the smartest or the most talented lawyer, but if you work at it every mm -hmm. day and you outwork mm -hmm. the other ones, you're gonna make it probably further than the talented one that didn't work. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, of course, there's a, there's levels to it, and, and mm -hmm. uh, but it's quite. Uh, I find that quite interesting, and I want the kids to understand when we mm -hmm. talk about talent that it's not just talent in hitting the ball. It's Correct. Talent of being able to do your daily routines mentally, how long can you hold on to that every day? That's a talent as well. So that's really... And did anybody teach you this or did you... I think, uh, I think from my father, that probably... God, I can't do it. <laughs> okay, cut. No, okay, your yeah. father, your family, your, your parents... Uh, probably, um, yeah, probably from my father. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are they? They're back in Curacao now. They're back home. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Ah. So, but it's also something that can be taught. But I think it's within. Right, so I'm gonna nail it. I'm gonna nail it. It's I just within. Have some, like red face, right? But I'm gonna nail it. I'm gonna go back to my father, uh, the hardest working guy that uh, that I know. Mm -hmm. Literally. Apart from you. Apart from me. Let's uh, go. Literally from. Uh, also, not just in words and making sure, seeing something and doing something else. Just really. Um, <laughs> discipline, very discipline. And also for my first uh, coach. The one thing that I'm super grateful for, so when I was 12 years old, this will be fun uh, for kids to know, I was not... Uh, we love this, we love this. I was Nelly. not allowed to eat, you're gonna, you're gonna think I'm crazy. I was not allowed to eat ice cream, pizzas. I never ate ice cream when I was little. I thought, I thought any, my dad was the devil. He's like, don't touch uh, it. Any carbonated drinks. Nothing. Uh, so till today, I'm 36 and extremely fit, but uh, comes a lot from my first coach with uh, um, what, he's, uh, what he's taught me and the discipline that I had from my father and the combination of my father and him. I, I also want the kids to know this. I never slacked one day in my life on the tennis court and in my training, but there were, there were those moments when I was 12 till about 14 
where I would sneak off and have an ice cream without him. You know, I'm a kid. I'm 12 years old. It's tough for somebody to tell me not to have an ice cream. Right. So I would sneak around and have an ice cream here and there. And so what's your advice on that? Because they do that. But I think that's fine to a certain degree. Eventually the message got to me. My coach used to wake up every day at six in the morning before I go to school and he would sit in the car literally and drive and I would jog. For about a year and two months, Robert would wake up every day. Wow. So eventually I got to the point where I said, Robert, you can sleep. Like I'll, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> I'll do it myself, you know, like I'll wake up and run. The reason why this is tough for me, and you've probably experienced the mm -hmm. same, and for some people it's easier to talk about it than others, but it's at a very young age where you're doing these things, you know, and I did it for the tennis because I love my tennis. So if Robert would have said that I had to wake up at four to run, I was going to do it at four. Yeah. If he said anything, walk on my head, I was going to walk on my head. Yes. Everything. So um, it was quite, uh, it was a good lesson, and I knew the point where I stopped. So I was having my ice creams and my burgers, but the point came where I knew it myself, where, hey, Jules, you're only hurting yourself. You think you're sneaking out with the ice cream? Right, exactly. So, but that point got to me. And I think um, from... It's important that hours, got to you at 12, though. Yes, at 13, I would say. This is great, yeah, because some uh, kids hear this in college, and right. it's already done. Yeah. You need to hear this early. You're only hurting yourself. Yeah. So, so, yeah. and that was the biggest lesson for me. And I knew that the day that I told Robert, and I remember the day clearly where I said, Robert, you can stay sleeping. I'm going to go run. And I ran more than what I had to that day. And then I, I said, uh, okay, I'm on the right path. And I, God, I'm going to ruin this interview. No, and you're doing good. This is and great. That I, would, uh, that I would make it, you know, not that I would make it, but that I got it. Like I, Because I you said, and how old were you again? This is now 13 and a little bit. And you said, I got it. I'm doing this on my own. I didn't need the ice cream anymore. I didn't need this. So That's now awesome. you guys laugh, but this is how you probably know me. Yeah. If we go to dinners, if we go to... You're not interested. You've probably seen it, but uh, <laughs> it's no alcohol. It's not any of the bad food. It's not, and, and I don't have to uh, say that about myself. Like my friends that know me, they, they go, I don't even get offered stuff anymore. Like it's, right. uh, it's fine. So. I broke through the barrier where everybody respects it, and uh, that's just what I did. And um, but it, in the in the earlier stages, it was really tough to to do it because as a young kid, I think you want your your ice cream. I, I'll give you a funny story. I went to Curacao, spoke to some kids back home, uh, gave them an inspirational pep that's talk, nice. and I was like, man, this is great. I'm connecting with these kids. And then we went for a run together. We came back. We did some footwork drills. And then I gave them a little bit on dieting. I was like, you guys are still very young. They were between 12 and 16. Uh, you don't have to go this strict, but this, this is how I did it. And this is what I wasn't allowed to eat. And the minute that I finished talking to them and the day was done, and we're, <laughs> they went inside to the bar and they were ordering a Coke and a croqueta and a, like a whole bunch of stuff. And I was like, man, I just spent so much time talking to these kids. And this is, so this is, this part is important also. And this is more for the parents and the coaches. You have to be persistent because they're kids. So Correct. you also have to lead the way. That's their responsibility. And eventually it'll catch up where the responsibility of the kid or the player will match that or hopefully surpass that of whoever's teaching them, right? So that one talk for mm -hmm. me with those kids, that was not enough. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up in saying that, hey, um, our, you know, back home in Curious, our kids can't make it because I spoke to them and they went and ate this. It's my, let's say, duty eventually, if I want to make them into tennis players, to consistently educate Correct. them and sit, you know, and, and then give them the, the confidence and, and the rewards for when they do do it well. Um, so I think that's part's important for coaches to not lose patience or change the message on a kid. And this is why this is so hard because, and I've heard this before, and I think this is also the way I live. It's not a sport. It's not the kid doing it. I mean, it is physically, but it's a group lifestyle. I think it's a lifestyle. I think coaches, like you said, are very responsible to continue the way the kid's living. You got to live like them. Parents, you got to live like them. It, it's it it's for it not to be... You tell the kid that you can't smoke and you can't, and the coach is smoking a pack a day. That's the, it doesn't, it's not, that message is not strong enough. So the support system is absolutely crucial in whether he or she will make it or not. Mm -hmm. I don't want to mention names, but some of my professional, uh, let's say, singles tennis playing friends that are very high up in the ranking, I know that 
when they diet, the whole team diets. Like, it has to be like that. This guy, if I'm eating whatever, fish and vegetables for dinner, so is everybody else. Nobody, we're not allowed to have this in the house. We're not allowed yeah. to, so it's, it, it definitely is like a, a support, uh, support team uh, involved in that. And, I, and I think that's how it should be. That's very important. As of right now, you have your coach. Yes. Your a physio that travels with us everywhere. And with Horia, with the same. With the same, we share them, yes. That's awesome. Yeah. That's and, cool. Uh, I'm very lucky because my partner, um, but that's also what I choose as my partner. He's a very hardworking guy. He's very dedicated, very serious. So strong. Uh, strong, big guy. Big guy. So we match kind of each other's, uh, yeah. By the way, the final in the US Open, I texted you about it. It was like a video game. Yes. Yeah, you were playing game. like a Wii video game. It was unbelievable. That was nice. That was one of them where it uh, kind of comes together at the right time. Um, and uh, I, I rarely watch doubles. I only watch you. But when I was watching, I couldn't keep my eyes off yeah, the camera. It was, it was great. Yeah, it was nice. It was really nice. And, you know, sometimes uh, we were prepared for it. We were ready mentally because those in those situations, it's not so much physically anymore. The adrenaline is going to get you through mm -hmm. those moments. But mentally, you have to sit down and really um, try to envision what it's going to be like walking on center court with the crowd. Um, try to see yourself winning. I think not enough kids like visualize really anymore or, or, or as much anymore. And that's so important. And um, I remember how big how big is this? How yeah, big? That's huge. That's huge. It's um, it's. That, I think that's uh, that's a big part of it. That's. A, and people don't talk about it too much. No, they don't. I'm, I'm proud of that for myself, and I think my habits have turned me into that person. I consider myself, um, let's say, when the pressure's on, I feel like mentally I'll be able to sustain it. But, it, but I've also, I also feel like I've prepared myself for that. You know, mm. so those sacrifices and those trainings and those things, like I feel that I've uh, prepared myself mentally for that. I tell a story all the time uh, when I was serving for Wimbledon the first time. When I was younger, I would think like, hey, how do these guys do it? These singles guys are playing. And then when it comes to the moment, you played the whole tournament, two weeks worth of tennis, and then you get to Wimbledon. And now you're one game away. Like you've done everything and now you have to serve for it. And it could be in a sticky situation. You could be five, four in the fifth set. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna serve and I'm thinking like, what goes through your mind? You know, like what goes through these players? Like, what did go are, through your mind? things that, that I wanted to know so badly that I, can and you I share did, it with us? Things that I didn't have access to, but I would wonder that so much. And funny enough, when it wait, are you gonna share with us or no? Yes. Okay, funny good. Funny enough, when it was my turn, I sat down, and if you go back on that tape, I was probably the first guy to get up. Probably I'm a little bit anxious. Right. Um, and they teach. What me. was the score? I don't. Know. It was. Uh, we were up seven six six four. I think it was, and then. 6-4 again, so 5-4 I'm serving. That's big. Sitting down, I mean, still close. Okay, we're up two sets, but sitting down. I'm already getting a little nervous I here. I got up yeah. and I went and I was ready to, to <laughs> serve. And the action, I was so proud of myself in that moment because I can say this, you don't always react the same in a pressure moment. Mm. Some days you might be brave. Some days for some reason you're not. And we're all human, so we have different emotions all the time. But you got to deal with all of that. You, have to deal you with gotta know. That. And the important part is also you have to accept all of them. Correct. If you're nervous, accept that you're Accept nervous. it. If you are not, or if you're feeling brave, then accept that as well and go out and do it. And mm -hmm. luckily for me, on that day, I got up before the other guys, I walked, and I had a bit of an attitude, like a chip on my shoulder. I said, hey, give me the balls. You know, I went to the ball boy right away. I was like, come on, man, give me the ball. Like, I was ready to serve it out. You know, <laughs> I, I was confident. I was serving well for the whole week. And... I just, uh, I didn't know, I didn't think too much on the outcome about uh, of winning Wimbledon, but it, I, I, what I tell people, I was the most, probably I would say the most prepared player in that moment to serve out that tournament, you know, like. I got you. I did all my routines, I practiced, I went through the whole two weeks. I you had did, visualized that moment. I visualized that moment before we got out to the court, I pictured myself with my arms stretched out and the whole thing. And um, so when we, when I went to serve for Wimbledon, I, I, t I told Hori and then I said it to the press. I was like, uh, I, I was probably the most prepared player to serve out that tournament. I felt like I deserved it. I felt like I So was you're playing. lucky that balls landed in your hands that time. Yes. Yes. And not that I don't trust my partner because he served for the US Open and he did a fantastic job as well. I remember. I don't know what he's thinking on that one, you have to <laughs> ask him. But in this particular case, I was ready for it. And I was, I wanted to be the guy serving and I was, so I was super proud of that, um, 
that achievement, but that uh, to conquer that moment. You know, like uh, I felt like my training put me in position to to be successful there, and and I was happy to come through. Yeah. So, and when you said that, it's it's nice that you mentioned this because kids now growing up, coaches don't really talk about this. They think that you in that moment, they have no idea how nervous you were. Yeah. I mean, you were you showing it getting a little tight? Were you showing it slowing down your serve? Who knows? Were you showing it with a little bit of an attitude? Were you showing it a little bit like rushing? Sure, but kids need to know that you are as good as you deal with your nerves, I think. Yes, for sure. That's it. I will, I mean, I have so many uh, quotes that uh, come to mind or like stuff that... that Get, keep them, keep them because uh, we have, we have a nice... You're, you're going to laugh at how the stuff that I told you and my, my let's say, uh, I don't want to say models, but like the, the, the way that I try to live my life and the stuff I follow, how, fun, how close it compares to the stories that has actually happened, you know, like how... I mean, it has to, in my yeah. Head, how it played out and in those moments, those thoughts and that kind of scenario kind of played out. So it's kind of freaky that way. Okay, but, uh, so let's get into that. We're going to finish here with two questions and okay. I have them and you can say them however you want. All right. What's your motto for living your life? If you have one, if uh, you have to pick one, because I can see you're a very philosophical yeah, kind of guy. For, uh, I have, I have, uh, I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> for living my life, I don't. Okay, no. The great, okay. The sport or the life? That's what do we do? For sports, I have a lot. For, for uh, I think this is important because you can combine it for both. The late, great uh, John Wooden, UCLA coach. I got to throw him in there. John sports. Wooden. He was our basketball coach. I read his books and blah, blah, and I loved uh, his definition for, for success. I try to pass that on to the kids that I speak to. I know it, but say it. I know I'm it. I'm going to paraphrase because I don't know it uh, quote by quote, so it's uh, paraphrasing here. He pretty much, uh, I will paraphrase it, but what he says is. Uh, few friends of mine that arrived here. Um, <laughs> what he says is that success to him is an individual uh, doing the best that he can every day, which is some of the stuff that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, that's con he, he would consider that person a success. So they would ask him, I remember, yeah, but who was the best uh, basketball player on your team? And you're expecting him to say like, or the most successful, so are you expecting to say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Lou Elson there at the time? Mm -hmm. uh, you're expecting him to say Bill Walton? And many times he pointed to like the bench players that were not the most talented guys, but great success stories in the fact that um, they tried their best every day, mm -hmm. they brought everything that they could bring every day, they were professional, and he considers them a success. And to me, that's the definition of success. It's like we're saying, right? It doesn't matter where you get or who you are or what you actually achieve. Is if you do it every day, you do the uncool thing. Yes. And day. you reach what you're supposed to reach. Yes. It doesn't matter what, but it's a nice thing you live by, and I think you do it quite well. Um, so, this is my last question for you, and this is... Can I throw two more in there just because I want to? Oh, so sure. I, think, I know, I love it. This is unbelievable. No, because I, I, it's, it's helped me, and, and maybe it can be one or two things that can help somebody out or if you have it in your mind. I think an important one <clears throat> that I love is whether you believe, whether you think you can or cannot, either way you're right. I think that's a beautiful one because it's true, that, that speaks to the mind, obviously, and how powerful it is. If you believe you can or you believe you cannot, both ways you're, you're right about it. But <laughs> Which one can be really bad for you, but one yes. Really bad. <laughs> I think that's a beautiful one. And um, I'm going to give you one more that I actually share with your brother, which I love. I think, yeah. I'm, and it's... Uh, I'm, Who's my brother? I don't know my brother. I'm kidding. Brother. Yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, and I, and I love it. Um, and it says, uh, in the moments of pressure, you don't really rise to the occasion, you sink to the level of your training. Wow. See what I'm saying? So, wow. that's a quote actually by the Navy SEAL, which I think is a beautiful quote because wow. that's, I think that's so accurate and so, so true. That one's amazing. Yeah. I need to look that one up. Yeah, it's a great, uh, I think it's, uh, it's great. Yeah. And th those are Do you think about these things every day? For sure. No, every, I wouldn't say every day. I mean, but not, if I find myself in a moment of uncertainty, you go there. Or in a moment of, uh, you know, I, I, I go there. I go there. I go there a lot. You yeah, go to sure. the uncool thing. <laughs> you go to the uncool thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, to finish, um, looking back, and we don't. You don't have to look back at your family. Don't get sentimental. No, but um, <laughs> looking know. back at uh, fifteen-year-old Jules with through ups and downs and you know winning and all of this like what would be one thing or 
a couple of advices that you would have for 15 year old Jules? Mm, 15 year old Jules, I would say number one on my list is to persevere. I think, uh, I, I don't know, this is just my... my, my no, this is going to help everyone. This is amazing. This is my feeling. Yeah. Like kids, we live in a world that we give up so easily on something. I feel mm. like it's everything's accessible and everything's easy and quick. And sometimes like the stuff, I don't want to sit here now and sound like a bunch of cliches, but sometimes the stuff that's like really worth getting, it takes a bit of time. And those are not the easy ones, usually. You know? mm. So Persevere. I think, I think persevere. I think that's uh, number one on my list. Let's go for three. Oof. Persevere is number one. Um, number two, I would have to say to be disciplined. And mm -hmm. this has to be taught to a, to a kid. Um, the discipline... You're not gonna. I mean, in anything, in anything, mm -hmm. you're not. You're not making it if you're not disciplined. So, I'm like you very much in the sense that, like, I hate the the coolness of the new generation. I like old school. Bo I like vanilla. I like mm -hmm. old school, boring, go to work, meat and potatoes, baby, and lunchbox. Yeah. That's what I like. I don't like. Don't get me flashy. I don't need ESPN. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wait, you. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Your um. What's it called? Your outfit for the finals in the open was flashy. True. It was flashy. True, it was Who flashy. did that for you? <laughs> that was my job. Well, Mind you, I laugh so hard I'm because. I'm gonna plug it now. I'm gonna plug it. But that's the company is called G U N N Gun. <laughs> yes, Gun. And uh, a friend of mine designed it. We're not showing that. And uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. a friend of mine designed it. And it was um, a little bit what has to do with in the world also today to show a bit more of compassion and um, no it, the, the actual the the topic yeah, the and the, the design yeah. was great but I laughed because I was like Jules is probably a little yeah it was crazy I had a big statue of Liberty <laughs> on the front of my shirt but it was just more of because it is like it doesn't have to be in there but I'm fed up with how some of the stuff's going on in the world today and you talked and about it after Charlottesville and I talked about you it talked about it in the in the interview I yeah I just wanted uh, to share a message of peace and love and you know which I loved was amazing yeah. Yeah. discipline perseverance number one discipline number two because you're not going anywhere without those two mm -hmm. um, and to be honest I don't really have a like those two are at the top of my list so strong I believe in those I mean if you can do both of those two things or if you have both these two things you're going to be successful um, at whatever level. At whatever level or whatever you, you do. You know? Yes. And the, the last thing that I would do, because I, I say that today to everybody, I love tennis. I love tennis. I love mm -hmm. it. So don't come with your negativity. Don't try to put me down. Don't take my word of it because I love it. So um, <laughs> I think it's to have fun at what you do. And like, again, very cliche, but really have fun at what you do because that's, uh, I play a sport, like a game literally for a living and I love it. And I, and I, every day that I practice it, I love it. So then you would say perseverance, mm -hmm discipline and what love for what you do yes yes, yes. Find, find that passion if you have passion for what you do you'll you'll make it with all this stuff and uh, and and the sacrifices that were made before i think uh, another i give you more more quotes here i love it i love it but um i follow a one of the like a paralympic quote this was from one of the swimmers and uh, it said i never sacrificed a day in my life it just took what it took just, uh, love really love find uh, what you don't love it if i were to go back and do it all over again i would do it all over again because i love to play tennis so all the sacrifices and those things i mean it took what it took so i i love it man i love so it i'm crying now yeah. <laughs>